Let's read the Apostle Paul again. Let a woman learn quietly with all submissiveness. I do not permit a woman to teach or exercise authority over a man. <laughs> wow! That clangs against our sensibilities like a thousand tire irons clanging against a corrugated iron barn. Can you imagine saying this anywhere outside of a church? It's hard to believe anyone is saying this inside a church, to be honest. Here we have the most rewritten verse of Scripture in the Bible, a verse which has divided the church throughout Europe and America, the most misunderstood, reviled, and abused command from the apostle ever written. Now, because this congregation has a high view of Scripture and because we believe it comes from God, we take this hard word from St. Paul very seriously, even if we still grate against it. It might help to soften it just a little bit by adding to it for clarification this is a letter from the apostle to a pastor about being a pastor and how a congregation should be run if we add the word in church to the command. I do not permit a woman to teach or exercise authority over a man in church. I don't know. And you can't say that this is because Paul is writing from a different culture. It's almost as if he can hear you thinking that. So he gives the rationale. Adam was formed first, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman was. No, the one about women wearing hats and long hair and men not wearing hats and long hair, that one is cultural. This one, this thing about pastors being men and only men, this is about Adam and Eve. First, when creation was without sin, and then again as a result of sin. In other words, this is a two-pronged command. This is about a man being the head of a woman, like Adam was of Eve. And now that the thing is all screwed up, this is about the second Adam, Jesus, the Son of God, who is a man being the head of the church, his bride. As long as we trust the apostles so that we obey him, resisting an irresistible tide of social forces, we are a sign to everyone who sees us that Jesus loves sinners. In this social arrangement we have, male pastor, we declare that Jesus is the answer to the longing of the human heart. Here's how. There once was a woman named Deborah. She rose to the highest heights as judge over all Israel. And she went looking for a man of Israel, and she found one, a man named Barak. Look, she said, God has delivered our enemies into your hand. All you have to do is go meet them, and you will defeat them. I will go, he said, but only if you go with me. She understood that this man of Israel was afraid. Chicken, a mama's boy. So she cursed him, saying, I will go with you, but because you won't dress like a man. The victory will be given not to you, but to a woman. Indeed, it was as she said. The enemy was led by a man named Sisera, and God sent a tremendous thunderstorm so that the enemy's chariots were mired in the valley, and they were sitting ducks, and the Israelites routed them. Sisera ran away. And he came to a tent inhabited by a harmless-looking woman. He asked her for a drink, being exhausted, a drink of water. Not water, but she gave him milk, cool, refreshing, sustaining milk. And his tummy was satisfied, and he fell asleep in her tent. 
So while he was sleeping, she took a tent peg and hammered it through his head. And I love how the author puts it. She drove the peg into his temple until it went into the ground. So he died. (laughs) I guess he did. See, the women are heroic. God in his wisdom made these women heroes. Nevertheless, her curse hangs over Israel. We're looking for a man. Deborah and Barak sang a song of victory together, and in it, Deborah calls herself a mother. She is a mother in Israel. A mother needs a man, and Barak wasn't it. And so we're looking for a man. Some years later, a judge arose, a man named Jephthah, the son of a prostitute. Hmm. Enemies have once again oppressed the Israelites, and Jephthah vows a great vow. O Lord, if you grant me the victory over your enemies, when I return to my home, whatever comes through my gate first, that I shall sacrifice as a burnt offering. He made this vow under the power of the Holy Spirit, which makes the story even crazier. God did indeed grant him the victory, and when Jephthah came home, his own daughter rushed through the gate first to meet him as only a daughter can meet a father. Oh no, shouts Jephthah, oh no! When his daughter discovers what he has vowed, she insists that he keep the vow. Oh my! But she says this strange thing to make a crazier, a crazy and grotesque story even crazier. Leave me alone for two months that I may go up and down on the mountains and weep for my virginity. Weep for her virginity? She's mourning the fact that she will not become a mother in Israel, as was her destiny as the daughter of this great judge. She shall not be a mother in Israel like the great Deborah. By the way, the daughter of Jephthah has no name. She's not named. And the fortunes of Israel have tipped down. Some years later, Enemies have once again oppressed the Israelites, and God this time appears to a woman who is barren. She has tried, but she also cannot be a mother in Israel. Yet God opens her womb, making her a mother in Israel, giving us Samson, the mighty warrior possessed by the Holy Spirit to go do great wonders including stretching out his arms to save Israel in his own death. This woman's name? No name. Even during the time of Samson, the fortunes of Israel are steadily declining. These poor, nameless women are a sign that Israel is in bad shape. Down Down, down they go, further into oppression and anxiety and hopelessness. Will there be no mother in Israel? Will we ever get our man? Oh, a terrible, terrible thing happened in Israel to this poor concubine, another nameless woman, this half-wife, a story too terrible and bloody to tell, a story which ends in a terrible civil war where many thousands in Israel died. And then one day, another barren woman came to church to pray. She was weeping while she was praying, begging God to make her a mother in Israel. Her lips were moving, but the priest could not hear what she was saying. This priest, Eli, thought she was drunk, and he told her so and told her to go home. She rebuked him, saying, I am a woman. 
troubled in spirit, not drunk on spirits. Do not regard me as a worthless woman. For all along I have been speaking out of my great anxiety and vexation. You see, she was putting words to what dwells in all our hearts, the longing for God to send us a man, a man strong enough to rescue us from all our enemies for once and for all. Eli the priest being astonished at this faithful woman, blessed her with a special blessing. She went home under this priestly blessing, and she conceived and bore a son. And she called his name Samuel, which says, God hears. And she dedicated the little boy to God, just like Mary dedicated Jesus to God. And Hannah sang a song which sounds almost exactly like the song Mary sang when she was pregnant with Jesus. And so we have a woman with a name whose husband loved her with a double love and whose priest blessed her with a special blessing, Hannah, the mother of Samuel, the first man of God we've seen in Israel in hundreds of years a warrior and a priest, a judge and a prophet. Some call him the first king of Israel. Samuel, the, the answer to the longing of the human heart in part. Hearts which wait with confidence, seeing Samuel as the great down payment to all the great kings of Israel, all the great men of Israel, and finally culminating in that one great man of Israel, Jesus, who stretched out his hands to save his people in his death. Eve, as you remember, is the mother of all the living. Adam, you remember, gave her that name. That's what her name means. All these mothers in Israel, starting with Eve, but especially remembering Sarah, Rebecca, Rachel, and Leah, these women in the book of Judges, Hannah, the widow at Zarephath, and all the women who attended to Jesus, not to mention Mary, the mother of God, which is no small thing, I hope you understand, the mother of God. All of that is wound up in this short, unhappy verse which clangs against our sensibilities. I do not allow a woman to have authority over a man. Well, how is that possible? Men are Adam, who is finally met in Christ Jesus. How can Christ Jesus have his own bride over him? In this way, the saying is true that women are saved by childbearing. All the childbearing of all the mothers in Israel. And finally, women are saved by the childbearing of Mary, who bore Jesus to us all. She is the mother in Israel, and every woman, by your being women, are Mary, participating in her childbirth, a pure and holy childbirth about which we sing every Christmas, round yon virgin, mother and child, sleep in heavenly peace, sleep in heavenly peace. Indeed, in peace, let the men become pastors, lifting holy hands without anger or quarreling. For there is one God, and there is one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all, men and women.'"